everybody. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Science Decoders. I'm Justin, one of your hosts. We got Jocelyn on the other end of the line. What's up, Jocelyn? I am super excited for this talk with Dr. Bailey today. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that I think we've been tossing around the old brain for long enough, and now we finally get to go out and do it. And I thought of the perfect segue for this for this podcast. So for Thanksgiving, I had to drive back home to Colorado, right? Uh-huh. And literally the second you get into Denver and all the way down, it smells like weed. Like it's just, <laughs> it's it's there and you are you can't escape it. You know you're right at home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that does mean that we are talking about marijuana today. But the first thing I wanted to do is kind of frame the conversation that we're going to be having today. So Dr. Jennifer Bailey is a professor at the University of Washington, and she recently published a paper called Marijuana Legalization and Youth Marijuana, Alcohol, and Cigarette Use and Norms. She and her team of researchers were looking at how marijuana legalization impacts youth marijuana use, youth alcohol use, and youth cigarette use. And marijuana legalization wasn't the only factor that they considered. They also considered the parental situation as well. So do the parents smoke? Do the parents drink? Do the parents use marijuana? Those were also some of the questions that they asked. But Jocelyn, um, why don't you give us a little bit about the history of cannabis and tell me about some of the health effects that come with it? Right. So unless you've been living under a rock, marijuana is a really huge topic, but it's also a very controversial topic. People hear different things about it. If it's bad, if it's good, if it's a gateway drug. But it's a mixture that comes from the dried flowers of the cannabis sativa plant. And I find I think marijuana is such a special drug because it kind of has this toes dipped into everything. You can't really classify it as like just as a stimulant or just as a sedative because it can depress, excite, and impair the brain. And that makes it really hard to classify. A reason why it's been legalized for medical use is that it, shows, it has shown evidence of managing pain. Um, And it's all thanks to this mind-altering chemical um, called THC that's found in the plant. And the reason why it's kind of mind-altering, it's because its chemical structure is similar to a brain chemical called anandamide. And because it's so similar in the way it's formed and the structure, the body recognizes it and it recognizes THC. Because of that, it can alter normal brain communication. I I know Dr. Bailey is going to touch on um, a lot of different health effects it can alter a lot of different parts of the brain. One prominent um, one is in the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is really important when it comes to learning and memory. And so that's um, because THC can affect the hippocampus. It can interfere with a person's ability to learn. It also interferes with a really important part of the brain called the orbital frontal cortex. And so that can affect attention, a person's ability to form complicated tasks. And it can also disrupt another part of the brain called the cerebellum. It affects balance, posture, coordination, reaction time. That's why you can't drive when you're high because your brain is being altered. It's like it's not in its normal functioning state. Yes. Do not drive impaired. Yes. Yes. If that's one thing you could take from this. <laughs> um, and then everyone's little favorite part is the munchies because THC also acts through some mm-hmm. um, special receptors in the brain called cannabinoid receptors and that activates the brain's reward system and that can affect and increase like pleasurable behaviors such as eating so hence for the munchies <laughs> but anyways we've had a long history of marijuana it actually dates all the way back to 8000 BC although if you're traveling to Asia and the Middle East back then where the first evidence of uh, marijuana was found way back then and even in China um, back in that time, it was cannabis was used for medication, and there were doctors who used it, um, pain management and menstruation and childbirth. Yeah. In India, it was used for religious uses, and you can see that depicted with different deities, and you can see them smoking. Mm. It wasn't really until the 20th century that people started taking another look at marijuana. So even then, in the early 1900s, mm. marijuana, like other drugs like cocaine, was still used in medicine. But it wasn't until 1937 that Mm -hmm. the United States actually enacted a tax on the sale of cannabis. And that was drafted by a guy named Harry Anslinger. He criminalized the drug and made that phrase of the gateway drug really famous, um, saying that marijuana would be if you use marijuana, it would open the doorway for like different using different types of harder drugs like um, heroin, methamphetamine, 
um, cocaine and so forth. And there was this movie called Reefer Madness, where it basically was so melodramatic and blown out of proportion. The movie revolved around high school students being lured to try marijuana. And from that, it went from, get this, like a hit and run accident, manslaughter, suicide, attempted rape, <laughs> and descent into madness because they were addicted to marijuana. Wow. And that really influenced people's perception of it. And even now, like, as I to um, learn more of just not even the negative side effects, but maybe potentially beneficial effects. Society's thinking of <laughs> marijuana from the 1930s still holds true today. Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of leads into some of the difficulties of using cannabis and researching cannabis. It's a classified as a Schedule One drug, which means that with very few exceptions, it's very difficult to get your hands actually on cannabis in a, that is researched or medical grade. And it's very hard to get funding, support, and um, the bodies and the, the technology and the science that's needed to really research cannabis and THC and CBD. So even up until this point in 2020, it's been tough to um, for cannabis researchers or for marijuana researchers to go in and to really pinpoint some of the effects and pinpoint some of the actions and the mechanisms and and all the other goings on that happens when a human ingests cannabis. And it's it's been tough for them. And so I think that's one reason why cannabis science has also gotten kind of knocked down by other scientists and, and kind of kicked around in the dirt a little bit is because, you know, a lot of what it's been up to this point has been very speculative. It's really a cycle if you think about it, because how do you know about the effects of cannabis if you can't study it? Exactly, exactly. So... Um, because of its speculative nature, cannabis research has really gotten a bad name and um, the scientific community have resulted to using social science really to gather more data about cannabis than anything such as biology, chemistry, biochemistry, neuroscience, even though all of those other aspects of science have a part to play. But as of 2020, there are currently 11 states which allow for recreational marijuana use. The first two of those famously being Washington and Colorado in 2012. And then three states in 2020, it is now uh, November 25th, but um, three states in the 2020 ballot had initiatives for legalization of recreational cannabis. And I know one of my home states, Montana, recently legalized that in the 2020 initiative. In 2019, the Truth Initiative reported that 27.5% of teenagers currently use nicotine, whether that's through vaping device or cigarettes. And according to an FDA survey, over 5 million middle schoolers and teens used e-cigarettes within 30, day, within 30 days before they took that survey. So that kind of just tells you that this wave of recreational marijuana sweeping through the United States is kind of on the rise. And we also still have problems that we've always had in high schools and middle schools, such as teens using nicotine, right? The NIAA reports that in 2018, 11% of all consumed alcohol was consumed by Americans between the ages of 12 and 20, right? 11%, one-tenth of all alcohol was consumed by underaged drinkers, right? And it's reported that more than 90% of this alcohol consumption, so 9 out of 10 times when a 12-year-old when a or a 14-year-old or an 18-year-old drank alcohol, it was consumed in such a fashion as akin to binge drinking, Binge drinking is having more than five drinks or five drink equivalents in one hour. So nine out of 10 times when an underage person is drinking in the United States, they are binge drinking. In 2014, scientists agreed that the D.A.R.E. program, originally started in 1983 to prevent drug and alcohol abuse, it failed in its efforts to prevent drug and alcohol use. And I think we can kind of see that with the current statistics that we have today, both from the NIAA and this truth initiative, um, which uses anonymous surveys given to America's youth in which they self-report usage of alcohol, drugs, and tobacco. So when, with over a quarter of the teenagers in the United States using nicotine and one-tenth of the alcohol being consumed is by minors um, or those under age, it, it's pretty apparent that this article has the information it needs to make the point that the D.A.R.E. program has failed us in those two ways. But more specifically, that begs the question, 
has it also failed us when it comes to marijuana and marijuana use and other drugs, right? Um, so one of the many political oppositions to the legalization of cannabis is the idea that comes from this old school dare way of thinking that marijuana, again, is a, um, a gateway drug, right? And we're not also establishing things like nicotine and alcohol as gateway drugs. Uh, so we're really singling out this cannabis and that's led to really difficult, that's led to extreme difficulties using it in research. And then, you know, lastly, if you think about it, right, we have at least eight years of data, right, at, or at most eight years of data, especially from Washington State on, and Colorado on cannabis use uh, in minors, in legal adults, um, and how it's impacted the taxes, how it's impacted the politics, how it's impacted the science, how it's impacted everything that's going on. And so I think with more and more states legalizing, we have this unique interest, this unique scientific interest to not only understand cannabis, but also understand if legalizing cannabis is having any negative effect on risky teen behavior. When we sit down and talk to Dr. Jennifer Bailey, she'll be able to enlighten us um, to some of those concepts. And we'll talk to you when we get back. Welcome back, Science Decoder fans, all the you decoders out there. Um, we're going to be talking with Dr. Jennifer Bailey. She is a social science researcher at the University of Washington, um, and she recently produced a paper titled Marijuana Legalization and Youth Marijuana, Alcohol, and Cigarette Use and Norms. It was published in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine. Um, Dr. Bailey, why don't you tell us a little bit about this study, and I think it would be an awesome place to start out by you telling us more about the, the benefits and the risks associated with marijuana use, especially in young adults. Sure, yeah. Um, so in terms of benefits, there are you know the, the benefits that people feel on their own, right? So for example, they might uh, have pleasant sensations or they might feel relaxed. Um, they might feel that it helps with talking to other people. You know, marijuana use is often done with other people and can be a, a social event, you know, that can lead to bonding and, and feelings of friendship and belonging and stuff like that. There also are some um, medical benefits that have been identified, of course, um, and you're Listeners may be familiar with some of those. So, for example, marijuana has shown benefit for people who have epilepsy, per particularly for kids who have very severe epilepsy. It can be a really helpful treatment for them. Also, there's a lot of research showing that um, marijuana can be helpful for pain. And I know some people use it for um, anxiety and depression. Actually, the research there is a little more equivocal. It doesn't necessarily suggest that marijuana is an effective treatment for anxiety and depression. Uh, and then, let's see, other medical benefits. Um, it also is useful for um, treating glaucoma. It often is prescribed to folks who are undergoing cancer treatment to help with nausea and lack of appetite. So there really are a range of benefits to using it. And we're learning more and more about medical benefits all the time. What are some of the risks associated with it? So it's not a good idea to use marijuana if you have heart problems. So um, if you, after you use marijuana, um, your heart rate can increase between 30 and 60%. And, you know, there can be changes in blood pressure. So marijuana can trigger heart problems in people who already have heart problems. It's also not a good idea to use marijuana if you have mental health problems, as I alluded to earlier, particularly if you have family members who have had serious mental health problems, like delusions, like thinking things that aren't true, or um, hallucinations, seeing or hearing things that aren't there. If you have family members um, who have experienced those things, then you should not use cannabis because uh, it can trigger those kinds of severe mental illness symptoms. You also should not use cannabis if you have ever been um, suicidal. 
because mm. cannabis use increases the risk for suicidal thoughts. Oh, I had no idea. I'd never heard that stat. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not a good thing to do. Also, particularly relevant to adolescents, marijuana use in the short term impairs memory and learning. I, I remember when I was in high school, there were kids who would sneak out between classes and get high. Um, <laughs> it's still the same. <laughs> yeah, okay. I figured as much. Um, <laughs> uh um, that really impairs learning. And of course, that's one of the major jobs when you're a teenager is to learn stuff so that you can function in the world as an adult. Also, heavy and long-term use in adolescence impairs memory kind of on a more permanent level and interferes with learning as well. And then, of course, um, using for a long time or using heavily increases the risk for becoming addicted to cannabis. And in fact, I know there's a lot of people out there who like to say, it's not addictive. It is, actually. So um, the earlier you start using it, the, the longer you use it during your lifetime, and the more you use it as an adolescent, the more likely you are to, to, to have to use it. With that in mind, um, a common argument I usually hear against marijuana legalization is that it's um, labeled as a gateway drug. So do you agree with that statement? Um, you know, there's a big controversy um, in the science literature, all the, the articles that we write back and forth about the notion of gateway drugs and um, whether it's really true. So when you say gateway drug, right, that makes me think if somebody uses cannabis, they will then go on to, they're more likely to go on to use cocaine, for example. And if they hadn't used marijuana, they would never use cocaine. Um, my personal ex experience and my personal opinion is that that notion is flawed, that somebody who's going to use cocaine is going to use cocaine, whether they u have used marijuana first or not. It's just that marijuana tends to be more available. And so that person will probably encounter marijuana before they encounter cocaine. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, you know, to get into your study a little bit, um, you were focusing on the effects of recreational or legalized marijuana on um, adolescents or youth using marijuana, alcohol, and cigarettes. I think those are kind of the big three we think about in schools and what our teens and preteens are being exposed to. Oftentimes, it's, it's pot, alcohol, and, and cigarettes. And you specifically looked at the city of Seattle, in which um, weed has been legalized in Washington since 2012, if I remember right? That's right. So why, um, why'd you pick just um, a data set within the city of Seattle and not maybe cities of like Seattle and Denver or all of Washington or rural versus urban populations? Like what, how'd you determine your sample? Excellent question. Um, so our study was not originally designed to look at the effects of I-502, the, the marijuana legalization measure in Washington state. Our study was designed to, um, to look at the effects of parent substance use on kids' development, right? Um, mm. And that study started in 2002, and we had um, – about 400 families in the study, 426 to be exact. Wow. Um, uh, and we had been following them from 2002. Um, we, uh, you know, in interviewing the kids and the parents um, each year, just to try to understand how parent substance use affects, you know, their parenting practices, or are the kids of parents who use cigarettes, for example, more likely to also use cigarettes. So we were just sort of going along doing our doing our thing. And then, boom, marijuana legalization passed. And we thought, wow, okay, so we have an opportunity here to look at how this changes the, the substance use behavior of both parents and kids. And our study was a good study to do that because we had been following parents and kids for a long time, right? So we had a lot of information about what their substance use looked like before legalization. So then we could compare that to what their substance use looked like after legalization. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's a way to adapt to the situation. <laughs> yeah, we were pretty excited. <laughs> yeah, um, so... Um, so that's why that's why this study and um, our study um, is is not just Seattle. So about sixty percent of our families live in King County, and about eighty percent live in Wa in Washington State, and another 
I think six or eight percent live in either Oregon or California. That is pretty diverse. Yeah, I mean, it is still mostly a Washington sample, right? So, so the things that we learn in our study might not what we call generalize. They our results might not be the same results that you would get if we had done our study in New Jersey, for example, or Florida or Alaska. You know, it is what it is. <laughs> And it's very fortuitous as well. Yeah, yeah. So I know you touched up on this, Dr. Bailey, about the developing brain in adolescence and about um, short-term use, how it affects learning and memory. And so um, based on what you found and your expert opinion, do you think there are some states and some political talk about maybe legalization um, should be for marijuana should be 21 or over? like alcohol, do you think that would help to deter adolescents from marijuana use? Yeah, I think that's a really important, um, I think that's a really important sort of age limit for, um, for marijuana use. Um, and there's several reasons. Um, one is that let's say we made the age 18, right? Well, high school seniors are 18, and if high school seniors are legally able to buy marijuana, then they bring it to school, they give it to their friends who are 17 and 16 and 15, right? And so then it makes it much more available in high schools and it makes it much easier for younger adolescents to get it um, just because there's that easy distribution system in the school. The other reason is that um, we know with both marijuana with marijuana and other drugs, that um, the longer people wait to start using, the less likely they are to have problems later in terms of using too much or getting addicted or um, having other negative effects that can go along with substance use. So later is always better in terms of when we sort of <clears throat> condone people starting um, to use marijuana. So I know we touched on in the beginning about health risks, but also health benefits. So do you think there's any benefit to legalizing recreational marijuana at all? Yeah, I do. I do. And so and and earlier, as you mentioned, we just focused on health and like um, individual benefits or individual risks. Um, I think it's also really important to acknowledge that drug laws are not necessarily applied equally to people of color. Um, so we have done some, some analyses in other data sets that we have where I work and found that um, African-American youth, for example, were much more likely to report um, police contact um, related to drug use than, um, than white kids were, even when you control for the amount of drug use that they engage in. So... So I think there's a really important social justice aspect to marijuana legalization and that it could be a really good tool for reducing some of the disparities in incarceration and um, assessment of, you know, legal penalties for marijuana use. Yeah, criminalization of marijuana goes way back. It does. Yeah, it's like the early, uh, early 20th century. Yeah. So the key method behind um, what you guys did for your study, um, it seemed like uh, there was a lot, it was a lot of surveys and you tried really hard to balance out, okay, men and women, white, African-American, Asian, mixed or other race. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about those surveys and how you use this thing called multi-level modeling to pull out information from those surveys? Sure. Yeah. So um, the surveys that we use are basically a bunch of questions. Some of them have, you know, multiple like response options, like choose A, B, C, or D. A lot of times we'll ask people to rate how much or how often they do something or think something or feel something. So, f and um, those surveys uh, that we use are pretty broad. Um, and we ask people about their, obviously we ask them about their marijuana use behavior. So um, starting with 10 year olds, um, we'll ask, for example, how many times in the past month did you use marijuana? Um, and they'll give us an answer, answer that, that ranges from zero to 30, because we ask them to think, when we say how many times, we mean how many different days did they use it? Um, and we'll say, you know, how wrong, we'll ask them to, to, to say how wrong 
do you think it is for someone your age to use marijuana, for example? And the options might be um, not at all wrong, a little bit wrong, really wrong, or extremely wrong. <laughs> Wrong ever. Yeah. The most wrong thing I could possibly do. Yeah. That's not <laughs> liter- that's not actually one of the response options, but 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 you get the idea. And so we we ask them about their marijuana use. We ask them similar questions about cigarettes and alcohol. We ask them about binge drinking, which is having five or more drinks in a in a two hour period. Um, and but then we also ask them about their relationships with their parents. So for example, um, Questions like, um, how much do you want to be the kind of person that your mom is? Or um, how much do you share your thoughts and feelings with your mom? Um, and mm. those kinds of questions get at um, the the bonds, you know, the parent-child bonds and how strong those are. Um, it, because we know from other research that families where bonds are stronger tend to have less substance use. Mm. Uh, the, the kids tend to use substances less pardon me. Um, so, and then we, you know, we also ask about criminal behavior, like in the past year, have you taken something worth more than $50? Yes or no. Um, Mm. and we ask about their grades in school and how much they like their teacher and how much they like their class. So it's really a broad survey of all of the things that are going on in the, in the kids' lives. And then the parents, we ask them about their drug use as well. We ask them about their parenting practices. We ask them about their the quality of their relationship with the other parent. So we have a lot of information about these families. And I just want to pause. I, I know none of them are listening, but I still want to thank them. They are incredibly generous for sharing their experiences and their thoughts and their lives with us. They really opened up to you guys. It's really valuable um, that mm-hmm. they do that. Um, so I'm, we're just really grateful. No, I actually listen when the podcast launches. Yeah, yeah right. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, but then you also said, like, how does this data go into this multi-level modeling thing that we did? So, um, so I mentioned all those drug use questions that we ask. Well, we haven't just asked them once. We've asked them um, multiple times because we've been following these families for years, right? Um, and we've interviewed them up to 10 times. Um, and so um, what we want to look at, we, we can use those, what we call repeated measures, because we measured them repeatedly. Um, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> so we use those repeated measures to kind of track how kids' substance use develops across age. So I mentioned earlier that we start asking about marijuana use when kids turn 10, but almost no 10-year-olds use marijuana. Just Mm -hmm. for those parents in the audience, (laughs) it's extremely rare for 10-year-olds to use marijuana. In fact, many of them don't know what it is. And we've occasionally gotten calls from parents going, "Um, excuse me, (laughs) now I have to explain to my child what marijuana is. Um, So... Uh, so we use those repeated measures to to track, like, you know, what proportion of 10-year-olds say they're using marijuana, what proportion of 14-year-olds say they're using marijuana, um, what proportion of 18-year-olds say they're using marijuana, so and so forth. And we can actually create uh, graphs that show how many kids are using marijuana at each age, right? And so you can see that when you're looking at 10-year-olds, the, there's zero kids using. And by the time you get to 15 year olds, there's, you know, 15 or 20% of the kids using. And right. So, so we use those repeated measures in, in analyses like that, just to look at how marijuana use changes across adolescence. But the multi-level model part comes in. So um, a lot of the statistics that we do, one of the, so one of the assumptions that they make is that the, the phrasing is that the observations are independent, right? So that that if you take person A and you, you have their answer, yes or no, did they use marijuana? And then you have person B and you ask them, yes or no, did they use marijuana? That the response, that the answer that person A gives you is not related in any way to the answer that person B gives you, right? Mm. They're independent of each other. But when you ask person A, six times whether they've used marijuana. Their answer at the fifth time is not 
independent from their answer at the fourth time, right? They're going to be related Mm. because it's the same person. And so what this multi-level modeling framework does is mostly it accounts for the fact that we're asking the same people the same question multiple times, right? So it um, accounts for the fact that my answer um, in occasion number five is going to be related to my answer at occasion number six. It's, it's great that we have the skill set to do something like that, right? To parse out dependent and independent variables like that. It is. It's really cool. And, you know, multi-level modeling is 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 really neat because not only be, can it account for the fact that um, individual people's answers are related to their own answers over time, but we also have families in the study, right? And so the multi-level modeling can also take account of the fact that um, the answers of a parent and their child probably are related, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's pretty slick. So in the results section, um, there isn't any reported correlation between cannabis use and nicotine use. Would you care to talk about that finding and other findings that you guys may have discovered? Sure. Yeah. Um, We were surprised by that one because um, there's a lot of overlap between cannabis use and cigarette use, right? So a lot of people who smoke cigarettes also use cannabis. A lot of people who use cannabis also smoke cigarettes. Some people do both at the same time, right? They mix um, cannabis into tobacco, which, uh, and, you know, in blunts. So we were really surprised not to see um, an effect of legalization on um, on cigarette use, but that's a good thing. That's yeah. that's a really good thing because c- cigarette use is not good, and we've made really great really great strides as a country in reducing the rates of cigarette use over the last few decades. And so um, that's one real worry that that. Um, scientists like me have is that if we legalize cannabis, then cigarette use might go up Mm -hmm. because they kind of go together. Um, And so although we were surprised, we were really comforted to see that 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 was not the case in our analysis. We also have done other studies, though, looking at, um, for example, if parents use cigarettes or cannabis, um, is that related to their kids' use of both of those drugs? And we have found relationships there. So um, uh, parents, if parents smoke, kids are more likely to smoke. If parents use cannabis, mm-hmm. kids are more likely to use cannabis and they're more likely to smoke cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Dr. Bailey, I know this is a little off topic, but now that you mentioned um, more about the cigarettes and your other studies on it and um, how we, America, and I guess the world in itself has tried to lower the amount of cigarette use. I know the Surgeon General put labels for cigarettes saying the harmful effects of using it. Do you think that'd also be helpful if marijuana was legal? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I can speculate. Um, I think, you know, again, using the the comparison of cigarettes. So I know I um I have some some colleagues I work with in Australia. Um, and I know in Australia they have those horrible like pictures of of nasty things. Yeah, they have the same thing in France too. On their cigarette packs, yeah, they're really they're really disturbing. And I don't I don't know that rates of smoking in Australia have dropped very much since they did that. Um, but, but this is not my area, so I don't, I don't want to say anything definitive, but I think that's an excellent question. That is something I want to look into after this. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, I have to say that, um, that scientists kind of don't have a lot of credibility, I think, around like negative effects of marijuana use with some people. And, and I think there's still a lot of distrust of the government and of science, um, you know, going all the way back to the whole reefer madness um, fiasco, which was obviously like not true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think we lost a lot of credibility with the public um, a, a long time ago, and and somehow haven't earned it back yet. So, so I'm not sure that warning labels on cannabis will will be effective. But but that's a great research question. Mm-hmm. Well. Dr. Bailey, is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners before we wrap it up? I think um, if folks are in legal states, um, 
It is possible for adults to use cannabis with very minimal risk, you know, uh, provided that you don't have heart disease, you don't have mental illness, you're not suicidal, um, uh, and you don't use very often. And by not very often, I don't mean just once a week. I mean like a few times a year. Um, and if you do that, that's probably fine. For teens, on the other hand, no, not using at all is absolutely the best. And delaying first use for as long as possible is really important. Um, I actually wanted to ask if you had any future studies um, after this focusing more on marijuana. Yeah. Um, so the paper that we've been talking about some today, um, the, those data were collected in 2015 through 2018. Um, and, and the stores in Washington opened in 2014. So our first paper there was really just kind of the first few years after the marijuana market was open and sort of stabilizing. Um, we've just put in a request to the National Institutes of Health um, for additional funding to follow up these same families through 2024 so that we can look at um, the first decade after legalization and stores opening. Wow, that's awesome. We've got all of our fingers and toes crossed <laughs> that we'll get that funding um, because I think it's really important to, to keep looking to see what, what's happening with this whole marijuana legal, legalization thing, particularly since additional states keep legalizing. Right. I think that's a really important thing to look at. So I do hope that that funding and that research really comes through and find some really great results. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you throwing that energy out into the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we just want to thank all our listeners. Again, everybody at SciWorthy and BMSIS. If you guys don't know what that is, get on the old Google, look it up. Um, you can also communicate with Jocelyn and I directly, as well as our staff. Um, at info at SciWorthy.com. And if you guys have any interesting articles, any interesting ideas, or maybe you want to become a staff writer or help us out with the podcast, feel free to send in your suggestions and we'll read through it. But until then, we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Hey, it's Gina here. I'm the editor-in-chief of SciWorthy. I just wanted to thank our awesome hosts, Justin Dingman and Jocelyn Solis Moreira, who made this podcast possible. We'd also like to thank Dr. Bailey for being our guest and our behind-the-scenes team members, Osama Alien and Sarah Treadwell. The Science Decoded logo was designed by Tammy Whitsons, and our theme song was composed and recorded by Graham Albright. SciWorthy is part of the 501c3 nonprofit Blue Marble Space. You can learn more at SciWorthy.com and BlueMarbleSpace.org. Thanks for listening.